Welcome to the Science to Muscle podcast. Uh, this time I have with me Sodak Andre, who is the host of the Muscle Engineer podcast. So welcome, Soda. Thanks for having me. I hope I pronounce your name well. I have kind of an obsession with names, so please, <laughs> if I didn't you yeah, it was, just it was quite good. I heard, I heard all kinds of radiation. I heard Zotac. I heard, I heard <laughs> uh, Stozac. I heard everything you can imagine. So it's good. <laughs> okay, so I didn't do that bad. All right. All right. So if you want to introduce yourself to our audience, or maybe people that don't know you. Yeah, so um, I spend most of my time in, in the gym, so that's already a good sign, I guess. Um, I work full-time as a coach. I train some clients uh, during and after the program. Um, I, like you said, I host the Muscle Engineer podcast. I do some online coaching on the side, so um, I'm basically living the full-time glamorous life of a fitness uh, entrepreneur, if you wish. <laughs> Cool. I, I'm just so, waiting for my Lamborghini to arrive, and so I can just you know drive <laughs> off to it or something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, I wanted to to start with something. I mean, not really personal, but something that is more of my curiosity uh, towards yourself than than anything else. Like I know that you interned for the Renaissance periodization. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So. Um, if you want to tell me a bit about uh, how was that experience, uh, what did you do exactly for them? What did you learn, maybe? Yeah, so um, so I sort of did two things with RP. Um, I I did for the company itself for RP. I did some infographics. Um, I did some content creation. Basically, I wrote some Instagram posts. I created a couple of intro. Well, I created quite a lot of infographics for them. And then I, what I, what you're referring to, I guess, is I had an internship under Dr. Mike Israel, who is one of the co-founders of RP. But I was not an intern under RP itself. It's, I think mm -hmm. it's a word it is a differentiation to mention. So I was interning under Dr. Mike. I took on uh, some online clients. And I did basically uh, the regular stuff, you know, so I did their diet and training programming. And I sent that over to Mike before I sent them out to the clients. And he basically reviewed them and sort of um, offered some suggestions, you know, some stuff I could maybe improve a bit or change here and there. And when he thought it was good, then I sent it out to the clients. And basically he was available to ask his, his uh, opinion and stuff. Okay, cool. So that was my own experience. I'm not sure what, uh, how it went for others because I, I'll be honest, I just, I didn't really ask him uh, after the initial uh, stuff. I, I didn't have too many questions and he said that, you know, he already uh, trusted, I guess, my, my uh, I don't know what to call it. I don't want to call it expertise. My <laughs> okay. knowledge base, you, I guess, okay. is the best way to put it. Yeah, Because I've come so. far from an expert, but... So, um... Something that I wanted to touch upon, like I asked this question so that we can actually jump to the next one uh, fairly easily. So, uh, the, the, I mean, of course, you're familiar with the volume landmarks and we're not really going to go to define. Uh, I, th I think our audience is also familiar with that concept. And if not, I mean, there are plenty of resources where they can find it. But I wanted to know if uh, those concepts, so the MEV, uh, MRV, and so on, is something that you implement in your own training with your clients, uh, your thoughts on it, and anything that comes out of that. Um, are you referring to in-person clients or online? Because it's a bit of different. Uh, if, you, if you don't mind, we can touch on both, but maybe we can start with online. Which is... Okay, so online <laughs> is where I would uh, more so taking into consideration something like that because to be honest in person like i am very limited by time i'm sure you know this uh, yourself as well um, like you see people four sessions per week is like a very very good scenario most people sign up for two or three uh training sessions per, per week so you have basically three hours or four hours with them so realistically at that point uh, you know uh, volume landmarks or max recoverable volume is not something you should uh, concern your, yourself with it's basically at that point the biggest consideration is how can you maximize those three or four hours with them you know so overtraining is not really something i'm at all uh, worried with in-person clients now if i had someone who like had i don't know 
outrageous amount of money and he said you know listen i want to um I'm at an intermediate level. I have been training for like three to five years and I want to uh, get even beyond that. And listen, I, I'm willing to train with you six days a week. Now that would be a scenario where I would, I would very much so start considering uh, these volume landmarks and I would try to progress their volumes and add sets and all that kind of stuff and try to see what it's the maximum they can basically do and recover from. But like realistically, with like general uh, population clients, that's not something I, I am all too concerned about. Now online, I do have some very dedicated clients, and that's where we do um, push things. Um, but that's also very much so client dependent, and also there is a practical limitation for time available to train, <laughs> which tends to interfere with those theoretical uh, uh, considerations. Yeah. So uh, with regard to the uh, increasing sets throughout the mesocycle, um, in, and it's something that like you you do uh, only with specific clients, as you mentioned, uh, it's something that you think is necessary or you can just start a mesocycle at a given volume that you know is uh, around your uh, minimum effective volume and maybe hang in there and slightly increase if, if things really if you think is necessary at some point but you don't really do this weekly increasing volume yeah so what i do not really do this anymore now you know and i remember people saying to me this like you know i already have this elaborate scheme planned out and i already know when i'm going to overreach <laughs> and that's i'm like jesus yeah. christ like good for you like if you if your life is so predictable like you basically know in advance eight weeks from now that I'm going to sleep like a saint for eight weeks and I'm at week eight, I'm going to lift this much amount for this many reps. That's awesome. But that's not really how life works for uh, most of us. So um, I think initially you asked whether I think that increasing sets is necessary. I don't yeah. think it's necessary. I think there have been plenty of people who have stuck with um, the same set amount. In fact, I think, uh, more, like most people, like in person, uh, outside of a couple of younger guys who also follow like Mike and these kinds of guys, like people who have been training for a lot, I don't think any of them is increasing their sets. Like they either do like three or four sets per work, per exercise, per work sets per exercise. And that's where they remain. And usually they, they just progress by a load. And I also know, obviously online, but I also know a lot of people who just start, like for example, I'm sure you know Jordan Peters or... Yeah. Uh, Callum Raystreet or those guys who more so do a lower-ish or more moderate volume, <clears throat> higher intensity type of training, or Joe Bennett, the hypertrophy coach, would be another good example. They mostly do like two work sets per exercise. They do what they call a top set, yeah. and then they do so they do a, a back off set. So basically, that's two working sets per exercise. And as far as I know, like they don't just uh, go from one top set to two top sets because then it's not really a top set anymore, you know? <laughs> and now, of course, you can add more uh, back down sets, but um, please let me know if I'm digressing here because I can go on these very long tangents. No, no, no. Actually, sort of, it, it's uh, something like... Forget. No, 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 no. It's fine because actually what I wanted to ask is if you if you listen to the Revive Stronger episode where it was Mike and Jordan Peters. Mm -hmm. and of course. Yeah. So, uh, and in that, I mean, first of all, in that episode, I mean, I was really shocked about how humble Jordan is. Like, mm -hmm. it, I had the feeling it was like it wasn't really a conversation, and, and it's not like I'm not saying this in a, neg in a negative sense, but it was like uh, Mike lecturing Jordan on his approach. I mean, I had that feeling. I don't know if you had the same. Yeah, feeling. I think I think actually. Um... As far as I remember, like Jordan said something to the effect that would be, you know, when he initially had that uh, loan podcast with Steve, I think he said something to the effect that would be very much open to hear Mike's thoughts. So I think he, like you said, he went into that conversation um, mm -hmm. trying to hear Mike's opinion. So basically, like, uh, like you mentioned, he went into it with the student's mindset, which is awesome. And yeah, like... That's what I like about Jordan. That's what I like about Mike. That's what I like about Joe, for example. Like they don't really care too much about being right or being 
um, you know, attached to one particular side or one particular uh, field or whatever team, whatever you want to call it. Like they just care about what works and they simply have seen uh, the type of training that they prefer work, but they also, Joe and uh, Jordan have both been very open in admitting that it's also very much dependent on your psychology yes. and your personal preference. So Jordan, like I've just, I was showing this to the colleague of mine. Uh, he posted some incline presses today on, I think, a hammer strength kit. He was yeah. seven <laughs> eight per side or something. Unreal. <laughs> and he was just screaming like a madman, like, like one, uh, I don't know, I'm not the kind of, I just don't have that sort of personality to, uh, I guess I could get away with it in my own gym because I work there, but I would very much likely be kicked out of most gyms here in Romania. I'm sure it's the yeah. same for you in Italy. So we couldn't really train like that because we would have to open our gym or something like that. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. there, are, there are already two reasons why that style of training probably wouldn't work for us. But it's also probably why it works for him and for people like, like Jordan. But Jordan said also in that episode with Mike that he only had like one training partner in like 10 to 15 years, which is his girlfriend, mm -hmm. Orin, um, who was able to sustain that sort of training. And I think for me personally, like saying that, you know, only one person survived, it's already a sign that it's probably not the best, the most ideal uh, way to train for most people. Because, you know, it's like, it's like those Chinese or Bulgarian weightlifting yeah. philosophies or approaches when, you know, we take a thousand kids or youngsters and one of them is going to go to the Olympics and the rest of them are going to just yeah. burn out or injure. Awesome. Like, awesome for that one person, but what about the rest, you know? Yeah, that, that's really a good point. I, I don't know if you're familiar with Josh Bridgman. Uh, it's, it's a man physique. Um, uh, tangentially, let's just say. I, I, had, I, have, I haven't had much uh, interaction with him. We had some back and forths. I've seen his photos. He looks great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, it just, uh, it's just that he, he brought up the same point that you said. It, uh, this, I mean, the approach that you take uh, is influenced a lot by your personality and the kind of person you are. So we, when you hear these uh, guys, that the, the English crew sort of, that uh, trains to failure, and they say, because we enjoy it, because we like it a lot. There was another recent episode of the JPS podcast where Jack Thur Thurburn and can't recall the name from the JPS, uh, but they, they talked about the uh, RIR versus uh, training to failure approach. And the main point, it was just that for some people it's more enjoyable to train that way, to train with such intensity. Um, and with RIR, it wouldn't be as fun for them to train. So that confirms your, your, your point about like the, your personality dictates the way you train a lot. I didn't listen to that so, episode, so, but it doesn't really surprise me to hear that. Yeah. And uh, with regard to programming, uh, RIR is something that you use, you prescribe for people. And did you find any lack of this approach, like in, uh, like in programming, like it's practically, because like one of the main drawbacks of it that people mention is that people think it's a one RIR when it's in reality is a four, five, and there are even research studies that show people aren't really good at, at gauging their proximity to failure. Mm. Yeah, so I don't really do that in person. Like in person, people don't really know what an RER is. I never really bring up the concept in person. I just, I, you know, I just watch them and I just, you know, when they want to stuff, I tell them to do two more. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> based on how, based on how they look or how they felt, I asked them, you know, how it felt. Um, I just increase the, the weight if needed. If not, we can keep it the same. And I write it down and I usually just progress the next time around. So it's not a huge issue because progression is going to take uh, care of most of it. Like, for example, I, once again, going back to personality, like I remember, vividly remember, like I, I, this was, I think, last year I had two clients. One of them, like she was basically uh, purple in her face and I would ask her, how, how, how did, it, did it feel? She was like, it was okay. And <laughs> you can see like a veins pop out of her forehead <laughs> and her few reps. So uh, meanwhile, the other one, she was, she was uh, uh, you know, 
she was like, we were doing, I remember this time around, we are doing like dumbbell hip thrusts and she was like, okay, I'm done. And I was looking at her like, you could have done like five more, easily five more. But we progressed nonetheless the same way, or we were prog- I was progressing with both of them. So, you know, in the long term, it doesn't really matter a whole lot because um, simply progressing takes care of it. Now, so online, I usually do prescribe reps in reserve. I usually just prescribe uh, a range. So basically, I don't prescribe three exactly. I prescribe two to three, perhaps for isolation. I prescribe three to four for compounds. Um, But we also progress in loads, and um, that also sort of takes care of itself, you know. And I also get, like, uh, form videos, and that also gives me uh, some indication on how their lifts look. Because, you know, if someone tells me that this was my one... Or this was my final week of this this mesocycle, for example, and I was supposed to do all of my all of my uh, isolation stuff to failure. And then I watched their videos, and I was like, "You had three more." Then obviously we we will have to be a bit more aggressive next time around. But if I if I you know prescribe to them, I, I've also seen this happen. Like I will prescribe perhaps three reps in reserve for someone, and I will see their bicep work go from like. 10 reps on the first set to 6 on the second set. That wasn't the 3 rep in, <laughs> three rep in reserve set, you know? Because if you got like 10 reps in the first, you probably could have gotten like maybe 9 on the second set. Maybe 8 or 7 in the worst case on the on the last one. So um, ideally, uh, you, you probably shouldn't really drop off more than maybe 2 reps in any subsequent set, like two is, I usually just drop by one. I've seen Mike drop like maybe two, but anything more than two maybe is probably indicative that you um, push this uh, way too hard. And I also notice this myself and I don't really prefer, like I notice this and I train with someone, sometimes I do this. I, on Hex, for example, I just push the first set. I was, you know, I, in my head, I think, you know, I have to do eight and then someone is there and they, they scream and whatnot and I get 10. And then on the next set, I get like six and I'm done. And for me, that's not really a smart way to train because if I would have stopped at maybe nine or eight, I probably could have gotten like eight on the second or let worse, like seven and seven. So, you know, if you add up, it's still like eight. Let's say I did 10, six, and then maybe four, that's 20 reps. If I would have stopped with like eight and then I got seven and seven, that's... uh What's, what's that? 15, 22 reps. So that's uh, two extra reps on on the not taking to failure type of approach. Now, I'm sure some people will argue, but yeah, but those failure reps were more effective. And I'm, I know you want to get into the effective rep concept, so we can we can also yeah. tackle that. Um, yeah, but if you if let's say you did a set of 10 and 10 was the true failure, the eight rep is already really, really fucking hard. Like, you know it. Like, if you do a, a set of 10, that's truly your maximum set of 10, anything past, like, five is already feeling like that. <laughs> like, the fifth rep is already hard. Like, it's not like, you know, it's not like the eight was easy and, oh, my God, only the ninth and the tenth is hard. Like, it's already really, really fucking hard, so. Yeah. Like, there is this new article that uh, Crack Knuckles uh, wrote on mm-hmm. the Stronger by Science, and he yeah. also did an episode. Uh, I knew, I know you had him as a guest, like in two episodes, pre- very recently. Yeah, yeah, recently. but we didn't. We uh, reported it a while ago, so it was before yeah. this came out. And, and I know he doesn't want to talk about it. Like it's fun because in the podcast with uh, Eric Trexler, he said, uh, like when I wrote that article, like I received like twenty emails of people that they asked if, if he wanted to come on podcast and talk about it, and he was like why don't you read the article like you want me to come to the podcast and talk about the same thing that i <laughs> spent time writing on the website so uh, but but I, yeah so if we can if we can touch from that like i would like to know uh, if you think i think is i i guess uh, chris bearsley and um also james krieger uh, they have slightly different model but they both um kind of wrote down uh this model that tells, okay, how how much is how great is the benefit that a certain rep, a certain proximity to failure, give us rep by rep, 
And Greg came up with this article say, showing that like the evidence for that model is not so strong. And at this point, we can more say, OK, a hard say is important, but how hard we can't really say. And what is, what is your thought on that if you had maybe a chance to read it or? Mm, I did read Eric, I did read Eric. Oh, Eric, sorry. I did read Greg's article. I do remember the infographic that Chris put, you know, with the shades and stuff. I'm not sure James yeah. Krieger's take on it. Um, I don't follow his work all that closely, so I'm not sure what's his opinion on, on the matter. Um, I don't know, like I've seen or I heard some people, I'm sure it was misrepresentation representation, because that's how it works usually. Um, the way Chris has put it, I think it's very reasonable. Like as far as I remember, he had like, you know, like it was purple on the top. It was basically just a darker and darker shade as he went to the top. It wasn't just, you know, like completely white and then yeah. suddenly it became like purple. It was a shade. So I, I think that's a pretty, pretty reasonable way to, to describe it. So, um, so the way I view it is if you're training for hypertrophy and you're also trying to maximize your time in the gym, because if you have endless time, then sure, you can stop whatever. If you train all day, even if you fuck around, I'm sure you will get some amount of training uh, return. I mean, you just look around in the gym. I'm sure you know plenty of people who basically all of their quote unquote works that look like the warm ups and they still make some gains. Yeah. Now, how many, how much progress they make in what time frame? That's debatable. But it's not like they don't make any gains at all. So, um, so that's for sure something we can already just dismiss in the sense that if this argument that you know the, only the last five reps, let's say if you were to take your sets to failure, then only the five, um, only the last five reps are really stimulative, and the rest are just waste. I don't think that's true. I, I think that was Greg's main point. I think he was referencing some studies where people like stop like far from failure and they still got stronger and bigger. So I think the argument isn't really whether you can get bigger and stronger staying far away from failure or not, whether is it really a good way or a smart way to train. Um, now, what I will say to that is that if you're stopping your sets so far away from failure that you can't uh, there's a train coming, by the way, so I hope it won't be too loud. So if you're stopping your sets so far away from failure that you have no idea how many reps you have left, like if you ended your set and I came up and I asked, hey, how many sets do you think you could have done? How many reps, sorry, you could have done with good form? And you were like, I have no idea. Well, then that's probably <laughs> indicative that it's probably way too light and you should start putting some more weight on the bar and pushing stats closer to failure. But I think once you get into that range of quantifiable, like, and by that, I mean five, because anything past five is, is it five? Is it six? Is it seven? Is it eight? Is it 10? You don't really know. Like you, you're so far away from failure. I mean, even the original RPE, I think they are usual RPE scale. Um, there was a point where basically it was not even worth considering. I think even thing, um, was it uh, Mike Tischerer who developed this, um, the RP scale for like um, lifters yeah. and sort of Eric did some follow up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The reps in reserve, like. Eric and uh, Mike Zurdus, I guess. Was it Mike Zurdus? But anyway, no, the point Eric is and, that and, and... past a certain point, you're basically just. I don't know. So basically you're just, you don't know. So once you get into that range of, I can already tell how many reps I would be able to get. I think you're already in that good enough zone. Now, um, I think there, from that, once we establish that, then once again, this is the, this is where basically, you know, this whole argument of it's sort of, it, it's funny. It, it's amusing me because it basically it's people like, you know, the, should I do more volume or should I do um, less volume and train to failure? <laughs> it's types of, or there are it's people who are debating each other who are already one interested in training, 
are training hard, are training often, are taking things seriously, they probably eat well, they sleep sufficiently because they care about these things. Like, have you ever heard someone who just, you know, comes to the gym two times a week just to, uh, you know, just the way Romanians put it is just to stay in shape or keep myself in shape. Have you ever heard these people talk about RIR? They have no idea what that is. So by definition or simply by um, having these arguments, you already sort of, you have a sampling bias, basically. You already pre-select people who are interested in this stuff and who take it seriously. So that's already going to take care of most of it. Like if you are interested in it and you take it seriously, it's probably going to mean that you do those auxiliary, auxiliary things that I mentioned, like diet and sleep recovery, but also you're probably going to be consistent and you're going to train for a long time. And those are far more important than whether you stop at two reps in reserve or one or four. <laughs> I, I hope I, I answered this. Uh, I, I can talk a lot, so please let me know if I if I missed something you asked. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's funny because uh, when you mentioned that, I was thinking about. I have people that uh, message me on Instagram and tell and tell me, "Look, I'm doing thirty sets for chest per week. Is that enough?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Wow, that's a lot. Like, I can't remember the the last time that I did twenty in a week." And I don't know, send me a video of, of what you consider a hard set and let's see what you consider like training hard. And maybe we can look at, okay, is this too much? Or are you actually training effectively? I really don't understand people. Like I understand the competitors that have this mentality. Okay. I don't want to leave anything on the table that could have got me the first place. And I got second. I understand that. But like the normal people that want to be in shape and look good, like I would be more inclined to think, okay, let's spend the less time that I can in the gym and get the most out of it, rather than the opposite. Like, it, it's really unreal. I don't know if it's, uh, if it's the same there, but like in Italy, this is a really, uh, like a lot of people are, are doing lots of sets per week, lots of like increasing sets every microcycle. Um, I don't know if it's, the, if it's an, a trend in Italy or, or whatever. I don't know if it's the same there. Mm. No, not really. Um, so actually, um, you know, I'm starting to notice a shift lately. Like I already um, have guys who mention names like Eric Helms, mention names like Lay Norton, you know, and yeah. sort of this sort of puts a smile on my face. But it's still very rare. Like most people still do uh, workouts. They they work their body, their muscle groups once a week, like they do the bro split. Most people only do like chest, you know, on Monday and then they do back on Tuesday and then they usually rest on Wednesday. Then Thursday they might do shoulders and on Friday it's usually legs and then maybe, maybe, maybe they do arms once again because <laughs> and this is the funny thing, like you know, I'm sure you heard this as well, like People will complain about lagging muscle groups, anything other than arms. It never crosses their minds to train it more often, but arms like, you know, I have to hit my arms just to make sure like, okay, that's not a bad logic. I actually, it's not a bad uh, way to do things. Like, you know, I want to prioritize these muscle groups. I, perhaps I should train it more, but Kevin forbid you train your legs twice a week because people look at you like what? Um, so no, it's still, I think the majority of people still train once a week. Um, I even had like, and this is something that annoys me. Um, I've had people who I've told them like, um, I have a, a friend who basically has no legs and I told him, listen, you need to train your legs two times a week, at least if not three times, what am I going to do the rest of the muscle groups? Like just do <laughs> upper lower, Well, that's not enough because you know, he's used to doing chest on its own and doing like 20 sets or whatever. So I think it's still very, very, um, I think we're still behind the curve, so to speak. Um, another thing that's really frustrating or just sad to see is the same kinds of people just resorting to steroids because that's something that uh, is very 
common here, I guess, due to our closeness to Bulgaria and Moldova and that <laughs> sort of region, which is notorious for like producing or having these underground labs that produce steroids of dubious qualities. So you wouldn't imagine the number of people who like basically resort to steroids out of laziness or out of yeah. um, lack of patience or lack of discipline, lack of willingness to work hard. Like I would, I would say that 95% at the minimum, if not 99% of steroid users are simply people who want to look okay. Like they are not your, um, I'm already at natural pro level. I've, uh, I'm curious if I took drugs, could I achieve like a IFBB pro card or could I get to the Mr. Olympia stage? Like most of them do not compete. Like there is this, yeah. there is this Sad. culture of, and <clears throat> this is even worse, like in this um, underground community of, you know, in the nightclubs and the, um, Anyway, it's sad like people who is this is the typical. I think if this is still a stereotypical Rom Romanian bodybuilder or the gym guy is one who is fat, has tattoos, and is on drugs. And so it's basically he is big, but he's also like has a lot of body fat. I think if you if you um, ask people what they thought, that would be still the most common way of <laughs> that people visualize like uh, gyms in Romania. Like I'm sure if you ask foreigners, they would they would think so, and maybe I'm just wrong. Maybe I'm just I'm just pessimistic. Who knows? <laughs> no, but but I can tell you like here is uh, unfortunately, and and it's really sad that you said as you said uh, the same. Uh, really, really seem. I don't know how exactly the situation there, but I just recently changed gym. So I was training at the local gym, and it was really like the 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 average age was like twenty maybe. And a lot of young guys, like a really clean environment, if you if you want. And now I moved to a bigger gym in Rome, which is one of the best in Italy, probably, if not the best. And you can imagine the, mm. the kind of environment that there is. And the, the thing that surprised me and shocked me the most, it was like, I know, I know the, the environment there. Okay. So I, when I went there, it's like, because I have all armor strength, now they lose, they have everything. Like, <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing. Uh, but I also... So I thought, okay, let's go there, and I'm gonna be this, not only the smaller, but also the weaker. Okay, and that's something that motivates me because I can see people that really train hard, really train with intent, and are way stronger than me. And it was not like that. Like that was really, like I was really let down by that. Like I can, I, I I've seen things like, okay, on the pendulum, I've seen people big as big as me or even bigger. I put on 40 kilos, 50 kilos, and then I go there and I put 160 for reps. What the hell is going on? Like, <laughs> like, and, and it was not like just one guy. Like, I, I, I saw other people like that. There, there is the occasional guy who benches like 140. I, I've seen that. But if you look at the average, like most people are way weaker than what you would imagine if you just look at them. And I don't know the reason why, but I can certainly, they, they certainly don't train hard. Like I can see that they, they talk between sets, like they have fun and they don't really seem to be pushing things really hard. So it's really sad. Mm. Yeah, I think that was, <laughs> you know, I, this is one topic where I will just, I'll, I'll fight till the end of my days. Like I can, I, one topic where I, I just vehemently disagree with like Greg, you know, he wrote this article that, you know, steroids, Lyle usually just mocks him that steroids don't, steroids only help a little basically. And um, no, like, sorry, but I've seen people transform in front of my eyes, like people who were way smaller than me, way weaker than me, didn't change anything other than they started taking drugs and now they are way bigger way stronger like i'm sorry but no like steroids don't just help a little like if they only helped a little people wouldn't take them Use so, yeah. exactly like and we also have since you mentioned we also have in our city um there is this bigger gym 
um, most of the um, people who want to be fancy basically to go there. But um, this is a there, there's a severe drug culture there, and I've seen so many guys who were big and strong, and then a couple months down the line, or you can you can basically see them transforming their pictures. Like either it's in the older pictures, you can look at them and they looked meh, and now they are jacked, or it's the opposite where yeah. they used to be very big, and now they just look like skinny. They shrink down. And that's basically only the drugs. Like I'm sorry, but yeah, for now, and, even and, if you, you stop know, training. Like, speaking of speaking of Josh, and he was very open about this, Josh Bridgman, yeah. and I had this discussion with someone in Lyle's group. That he said that he took like 250 milligrams of test per week, maybe 300. So basically, a baby dose, like something that most people wouldn't wouldn't even deem efficacious. And it, he said that it doubled his natural testosterone, like from 650 to like 1300. And I know that test levels don't exactly cover it, but if you think that going from 600 to 1300 is not going to also give you muscle angst and strength, then I'm sorry. Like I have news for you. Like <laughs> I've seen. I've seen reports, I mean, in this testosterone group just for fun. And I've seen people who were like borderline uh, hypo, uh, what's the word? So basically they were on like 300, uh, you know, on the testosterone level, like it goes from 300 to like 900 to 1000, maybe something like that. Nanogram per deciliter, I think, is the unit. And, uh, you know, they went to a doctor and they simply from that going from three to 600, which is like mid normal. So it's not really high. It's just mid normal. Their sex life transformed, their energy levels transform. They started putting on muscle. They started losing fat, you know? So don't tell me that going from 600 to a thousand or 2000 is going to do nothing. And people that's only with 250 milligrams. Like there are people who take, I know guys at our gym, but take like gram plus per week, you know? Um, now, of course, of course, diet matters, sleep matters. I know a ton of guys who abuse drugs and who try to make up for dumb shit by using more drugs. But guess what? Using more drugs is going to get you more results. Now, of course, you might die in five years. That's another point, but another side of the, of the story. But drugs work like, I'm sorry, they do so. And simply the, not just that, but the recovery, like speaking of MRV and that sort of stuff, like I heard both sides of the story and I don't want to turn this into a drug uh, discussion. It's just something that figure it's worth mentioning, yeah. speaking of uh, MRV and stuff. Um, I've heard stories from like guys who said that, you know, I was on trend and I didn't sleep for two days. And I was fine. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I if I don't sleep my eight hours, I sleep seven. I already f- feel the difference. Like if I yeah. sleep six, I'm, I'm dead. Like I feel like shit. So, what? And even I guess uh, testosterone, like low testosterone levels, are correlated with uh, higher injury risk. I think, as well. Oh, yeah. So I, I don't know if that plays a role, but I mean, I've seen like because uh, practically I've seen people perform exercises really, really bad, like. I guess I saw two weeks ago one of the the single worst deadlift I've ever <laughs> looked someone do, and I thought to myself, okay, if I do that one rep, I I <laughs> herniate a disc, and mm-hmm. and they seem to be doing just fine. Like, who, like who cares? Like that my my back is rounded, like like a moon. But whatever. Okay, so if we can go a little bit back to the. Um, uh, intensity uh, topic. I wanted to mention something because I know that you follow the muscle mentors on the, on social media, um, and I really like their their stuff. Um, and uh, someone recently asked Luke uh, in a story uh, his thoughts about this um, RAR versus training to failure. And I, I also think he just did a recent podcast on it, and I uh, haven't had a chance to listen, uh, but I'm sure because he posted like yesterday, and he said something like. Uh, as long as they don't take into account like mechanics of movements and resistance yeah, profile, yeah. they're missing a, something. So if you can touch on that topic and tell me whatever whatever you think about resi- because I know you use bands to reverse bend the hack squat, which is uh, known to be a really <laughs> heavy exercise at the bottom, like really really heavy. And... Yeah, 
Mm. So if you can expand on that. Yeah, so actually it's funny because right now I'm training a girl who is very knowledgeable already. And, you know, she follows like Brett, she follows James Rieger and all that sort of stuff. And um, she knows how to train, generally speaking, but she she basically just follows these general guidelines that most people in the industry do. And, you know, they all have these arguments like, Oh, volume or this, how many sets should I do? Meanwhile, they don't even consider stuff like Luke mentions, like resistance profiles, how to align your, um, how to set up properly for, for the desired result, how to align stuff so your joints don't um, give up on you in like five years, um, you know, how to sequence exercises so I don't just do um, the same, so I don't just load the muscle in that same muscle length, basically, just with different exercises. Um, how can I alter my setup? What modalities can I use to maybe improve the strength profile of this exercise so it matches my, or the, sorry, the resistance profile of the exercise so it matches my, the strength profile of my body. And all of those or might be minutia in a sense, but it's what we are discussing about sets or RIR is still minutia as well. Minutia. And that minutia makes much more of a difference because it actually impacts longevity, which is arguably a far bigger factor than, you know, whether you do it 20 sets or 18 sets in the last couple of months. So this is what I'm working right now with her. And, you know, that stuff really starts matter, starts to matter once you're past your initial uh, newbie phase. And once you start developing these these uh, lagging muscle groups, because for example, just you know my my struggle with my chest, and uh, it hasn't really started growing until I learned how to actually set up how to put my chest in a better mechanical mechanically advantage advantageous position, um, how to be mindful of my range of motion, so I don't just get into that passive uh, uh, passive range or I don't change my setup by trying to for example trying to get as low as possible with the bar and i might just get end up you know in a, a scapular uh, elevation because i cannot maintain you know that nice arch and i just end up sort of this way which i see so many people do they just they they run out of uh, horizontal abduction basically and to compensate their body basically uh, elevates their scapula and their shoulders turn inwards and they lose their packs, lose all of their uh, leverage, basically. And, um, you know, that's really obvious once you start, like, um, I remember just a couple of weeks ago, someone came to me to see the gym and we sort of, I just, I was just starting my workout and we were sort of training together. And he was like, you know, my chest is a really weak muscle group. So I'm really glad that you're also doing the push workout. And the moment he, he just laid back on the bench and started pressing, I, I was like, okay, of course it is. I, I can already tell, like, you're not using your chest at all. Like, it was a typical, you know, hunchback, like, pressing like that. And basically, it's all front, there, no chest. And that's how I did it for a while. Um, this girl I'm training, she uses for all of her pulls. It's obvious she doesn't really use her lats. He, she, all she does is basically pull from her upper back and guess what she has no lats basically <laughs> so these sort of things really matter and um, um, and if you don't start developing a very um, not necessarily educated but I guess it's, it is an educated way of, of doing your training but it's also very methodical I guess is a better word so you have to be very strategic and methodical with your training if you want to maximize now of course this doesn't really matter to that population we mentioned previously who just wants to get fit and then they can do whatever but if it's someone who is really interested uh, in developing a very symmetrical and balanced physique or is someone who's interested in competing then these things start really that these things really start to matter and um and luke was right and i also mentioned or we discussed this in a in a in a private messages with him uh, that uh, people are really missing the they are not prioritizing the right stuff and i think uh 
it, it starts to matter more and more uh, the stronger you get. Because I think like if you're if you're doing one of the, like uh, the reverses band Smith machine for instance, where you you put yourself in a uh, not dangerous because I don't want to say dangerous position for your shoulder, but for for delicate position for your shoulder, especially for someone that can't get into ex external rotation, extension, and so on. Like you just uh, reduce the risk of injury in in the range of motion where you are more exposed to it, and Another one that I noticed, like I have a Cybex hack squat uh, where I train, <clears throat> which is unreal. One. Yeah, but that's really, really heavy at the bottom, like really heavy. Um, and I, it, al it always gave me knee pain. Like I couldn't do it. Uh, always, always, uh, every time that I tried, I, it always gave me knee pain. This, the moment I started band uh, reverse banding it, like I went from doing 100 with knee pain and no quad pump to doing 140 for reps, no knee pain, really good pump at the core. Exactly. Like, yeah. And that tells you, okay, there is something going on. Like it can't exactly. just be, yeah. And it, yeah, you're making the machine better. And that works for a lot of other things. Like do you do, you do the, the uh, cuff to line uh, uh, lateral raises with the cables? Have you tried it? Uh, I wish I had, I wish I had a way to do them. Unfortunately, I don't. Uh, the owner just sent me today uh, used Banata dual cable station. He sent it to me to see my thoughts, and of course, I said it said that it would be good. Now, unfortunately, we are limited by space and, of course, money. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we we will be able to get that. But if we did, then I will I will of course we'll do them. But right now, I just do single arm cable. Let yeah. Me... So yeah, with the machine. Yeah. So. And then, then that, like what I was saying is that that's a movement where if I go to failure, it's because the side delts give up. It's not. It's not that I start to feel my traps. It's not that I start to feel my wrist, and uh, I, it's my side delts. Like I can't get a more yeah. one more rep because my side delts give up, and that's a, f a feeling that you can't get with dumbbells. Um, there is, so this thing matter, and and the moment you start implementing them, you realize it. Uh, yeah, exactly. I was just going, I was thinking about this, that I don't really like to get into arguments with people because um, if I have to really, you know, if I have to start, if someone isn't really convinced that words really aren't going to, to convince them, but, you know, the, like you said yourself, the moment someone actually tries it, someone actually alters a setup or implements bands properly, not in an improper way, making the exercise, you know, just heavier where it already is heavy, like doing, for example, rows with a band, which is a very bad idea for most most of the time. Um, it, they just feel the difference instantly, and they are basically they, they they are convinced and they are turned, you know, their their whole uh, mindset shifts. And, uh, you know, I have the same experience with your, like yourself. Um, I did the reverse bands last week for the first time because on or on our old head, heck, I wasn't able to, to set it up, but, um, this one, I can actually set up a band to do reverse band. It's awesome. And I don't know if you, you mentioned something about pendulum. I don't know if you tried the Atlantis pendulum, but no. it, feel, it just feels like Atlantis has has a couple of machines that are so good. Like the pendulum is so nice that it, you know, as you get into the, you know, the most squat machines, they are really, really heavy at the bottom in full knee flexion. Mm -hmm. And they are sort of a joke at the top. And this one is, I guess, lighter at the bottom and that's heavier at the top. It just feels so much better. It feels harder. Mm -hmm. And the, what you mentioned about, um, you know, these things matter, starting to matter more. Yeah, they do. Cause, once you get stronger or once you get more advanced, basically progress is really, really, really slows down. And if you don't implement these things, you're basically just leaving a lot of, a lot of stuff on the table. Like you're just, it's a lot of wasted work. Like for example, if you don't, um, if you just do regular squats, are they, well, this is, uh, if the person actually does them uh, sufficiently deep, because otherwise it's just, this is a moot point, but let's say that the person actually does deep uh, squats in 
you know, hamstrings pressed into their calves. Is it heavy at the bottom? Of course. But how much work are you missing out on? Like, think about it. If you can tolerate or if you can do or use three, 140 kilos for eight, let's say, uh, in the bottom, you probably could use 180 at the top, you know? Now, it's a bit uh, tedious to set up uh, free squats with a band. You can, it can be done, but it's a bit of a pain in the ass. So what you could do is either prioritize or sorry, periodize and just alternate between, you know, uh, realizing that, hey, it is what it is. I'm just going to do regular squats. They're not the best exercise, but they are good. And I will strategically switch them out and replace them with a reverse banded hack where I can actually optimize the resistance profile a bit more. Or what you can do is, uh, let's say, um, do your deep squats and then find some sort of a modality where you can actually overload the um, top two thirds of the movement. So for example, something I, um, you could do pin squats, for example, you know? So you set a pin and you stop. So others will probably tell you that you're an idiot because you do half reps, but if this is done after deep squats, then you can probably just, you know, justify to listen, idiot. I already did like five sets of deep squats and this is just a, or you can just ignore them and <laughs> mind your own business, probably the best, <laughs> the best scenario. Um, so pin squats, for example, would be a good way, but I don't know how, how uh, well your knees would tolerate that because I honestly never really tried that. So, so I think for free weights, it's probably best to not really mess around too much because um, I don't know, it just, it doesn't really, like I was discussing this with Greg Knuckles a while back. He was saying it was about something else. It was about building confidence during squats because mm -hmm. this is something I, you know, the bar, you know, that he, feeling of something heavy on your back, it just yeah. can really mess with your head. And he was telling me that partial reps with like really heavy weights can build, but he's build confidence, but he said that uh, the knees might not thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> that might not be the best idea, but reverse banded hex are awesome. And uh, if you want to go really pro level, you can do what Joe does, for example, is set up you know, these daisy chains and carabines. And the whole point of that is that you are then no longer limited by the length of the band. Because, you know, yeah. if you set up the way I just keep it easy, I know it's not optimal, but it's going to work for now. If you just set up a band that you're basically just limited by the length of the band and also where you loop it. So if you um, have a fixed, have, have a fixed point or, or one way you can set up the band, then you cannot really adjust how much it stretches, where it stretches. But if you get those daisy chains and you get a carabine, you can set up the band so it actually um, is completely deloaded at the top or it doesn't pull on the machine at all. And then once you get into that bottom, then it really starts to kick in. But well, like I said, it's a bit more tedious. Um, you have to be able to have, probably need multiple bands because you also need a drastic change in resistance for that to work. So um, you will also probably need a lot of weight. So it's a bit of more, of a, more of a work to figure out, but it can be done. But, you know, this is something I also noticed uh, for myself and for most people. It's very nice to have these things, but it also needs to be something that's uh, relatively easy to implement. Because, you know, if you need like 20 minutes to set up the, the exercise. Is it worth it? Most days or most people will just, will just not bother. I had the same stuff with, um, with our old, the way I was doing banded dips. Dips are not exercise speaking of feeling weird like banded dips feel surprisingly good on my elbows now i'm just doing regular dips and they just feel weird like they feel really heavy at the bottom not much at all at the top it just mm, doesn't feel doesn't feel uh natural but banded dips felt great but it took me like five minutes to set up because i needed i needed like a box to put uh, a dumbbell on top of it and I needed a carabine to loop the bend to it and then I needed something to a chain and basically needed the right height so 
the plate doesn't hit the box and it was just a mess it was great once i figured it out but it took and many 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 times i just i couldn't be bothered and i just did something else and that's also a consideration to take into account yeah do you have time for one last uh yeah sure, sure okay so uh, at some point you also mentioned um exercise order when it comes to resistance profile um, something I've done recently is to do the leg extension before um, a big uh, squat pattern compound. And I also programmed it to the to a client and he was like, uh, why the leg, sec the leg extension is first? Like, and I said, because it's a good exercise, like the squat, it can come first. And, and something, an argument uh, in favor of this is that it's the hardest at the, uh, at the point where the, mus the, the quads are uh, mostly contracted, so you're weaker. So you do it first because fatigue kicks in in the workout and doing last, maybe you're not uh, using that range of motion efficiently. Uh, what is your thought in, on selecting the exercise order based on the resistance profile of the movement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so once again, I was just telling this to this girl I'm training yesterday because I really like her because she asks a lot of questions. And um, we were discussing the stuff about uh, back training, so I will, but I also will address the leg extension you mentioned. So I was telling her that, you know, in order to get like the lats really short, you need like a row and you basically need to come with the elbow, you need to think about coming into your spine basically to get into that insertion. But anyway, the point I was trying to make to her, we were discussing the umbrella was, is that, you know, in order to get to that really, really short position, the load needs to be so light that the rest of range of motion is basically a joke. Or another example I gave to her is like doing post hip thrust. And she was, like I said, you know, she was, she, she was sort of following breath and this whole argument that, oh, well, post hip thrusts are awesome because there is peak tension at the top and the glutes are short and then and they get so much stimulus. I was like, yeah, they get stimulus in that range, in that isometric, but what about the rest of the range of motion? Because if you're doing like a six second pause where she was doing at the top of the hip thrust, like the rest of 90% 90, 90 of the range of motion is basically a joke. Like if you're using 100 kilos at the top for a six second pause, you probably could use 180 from the bottom, you know? So um, I think there is merit to trying to cover the entire contractor range of a muscle. But from what I heard, from also from Luke, from Joe, from people who are, and from just, you know, noticing what other experienced lifters have done. It seems to me that trying to load a short on range too heavily doesn't make too much of a sense. Like, do you know those prime extensions? And now to get back to the leg extension, do you know those prime, you know the prime fitness? Yeah, that you stuff? can choose the, you can change exactly, the... Exactly. And Luke was mentioning this is a podcast that um, the muscle tires uh, regardless. So basically, if you started, let's say you wanted to load all of the plates on that, I don't know where the pin is, but basically the shortened range. And you have this, you know, this theoretical concept in your mind that, okay, so first what I'm going to do is I'm going to do three sets in that shortened range. I'm going to really, really squeeze that or nail that range of part of the range of motion. That's awesome, but it's also going to take away from your um, force production capabilities for the other parts of the range of motion. So you also need to consider efficiency. And that's where I think uh, selecting and prioritizing exercise that covers maybe 75 or 80% of the contractor range of a muscle is going to have more merit than trying to nail every single part. And I also think that um, trying to prioritize the short run reach too much is not is not really worth it. Like uh, you know, or basically um, going for that uh, just brutal contraction. Like for example, during a lying leg curl, you can do this. You can put yourself in this uh, active or passive in active insufficiency. Mm -hmm. Basically, you you um, can extend your your hips. And then do the so you basically with the torso straight and then do the leg curl and it's just going to feel awesome it's going to be basically you're going to cramp up but you'll be also losing like 10 kilos so i think there is you also so basically 
keep long story short, you must also consider the balance between, yes, training the entire range of motion or the entire contractor range, but also must consider loading capabilities. So um, the example you mentioned about putting the extensions first, I think that's a good idea, but uh, that also will mean probably that you will not be able to do uh, or use as much load during the squats. Yeah. Now, the opposite or the other, the advantage of the leg extension is that it's a stable environment. So you could, what I like to do, for example, is I don't do work sets first, but I do warm up on the leg extension. Then I do a mid range exercise. So usually leg press. Um, and this is also something that I think John Meadows is a very good example of this. He is very big on sequencing exercises. And um, I also noticed this on myself and many others that exercises that um, stretch muscle don't feel really well fresh. So starting yeah. out a session with an exercise that really stretches the muscle, it can work. And I do do it for beginners. But once you're, you know, relatively strong, it doesn't feel the best. Like doing hex squats right in one, right at the start of your session, or doing score crushers on the start of a yeah. of a uh, arm session, or doing Romanian deadlifts at the start of a hamstring session, for example. Can it work? Sure, but I think at least warming up on something that contracts the muscle is not going to be a bad idea. And um, sequencing wise. Uh, I think prioritizing um, an exercise or a part of the range of motion that you can use the most weight for the longest range of motion is going to be best. So, for example, the reverse banded hack is something I would prioritize over the leg extension, even though it doesn't really load the shortened range, uh, it does load like most of the range of motion, or for example, the lats. Um, I would prioritize some sort of pull up or pull down over a dumbbell row that could really load the shortened range, but you probably can't use as much weight. Now, you, what you could do is just do a couple of warm-up sets so you do get into that range of motion, but try to not really waste too much of your uh, uh, effort or time there, because ultimately you're, li you're limited by the amount of time that's available to you, and also you're also limited by how much force you can produce in any given workout. Because you, as you know yourself, like you have maybe eight to ten sets in any given workout for a muscle group. Like anything past that, it's because you know I, I have a friend who is who is um, is a good guy. Like he learns, but I remember like maybe a year ago or six months ago. I think it was a year ago, he came to me like with these monster lectures and like sessions. And I was like, what do you think? And I looked at his logbook, I took his his pencil, and I basically just, you know, dragged the line uh, at the middle of it. And I was like, that's where you stop the first, the workout, and that's where the second starts. Like he had, I don't know, uh, squats, leg press, hex squats, uh, uh leg extensions, hip thrusts, Romanian deadlifts, calves, like basically in one session, I was like, that's two workouts. No freaking way in hell that you can do that. I mean, you can, but past the third exercise, you would, we would be using warm-up weights for the rest of them. You just can't. So um, that's another mistake I see many people do is just doing too many exercises in one workout. I think doing more than three exercises is a waste for a muscle group. I think you can cover most exercise, most muscle groups with two and uh, three is the most I would use and simple muscle groups like the bicep only need one realistically. And if you want to change your, you know, uh, shoulder position, for example, because that change, changes the biceps uh, length, then just do that in different workouts throughout the week. Yeah, I completely agree. Like maybe the back, if you're like not the lats, it's but the back, maybe like four or five exercises, but that's not like only the, for the lats could be two, three, and then I don't know, something for the upper back or rear delts, and then we get to like five, but that would be the whole, uh, mm -hmm. some, some people like to, I 
also like to put um, deadlift variation on a on a on a pull day and to load more of the uh, lower back. Um, so if one starts to consider the back as that, maybe more movement uh, might be needed. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. for example, for the back, I don't know. Even for the back, I think you can cover it in like four. Like you can take the differentiation to start. Um, if lats are a priority, for example, you can use something that would get them short-ish, um, and then do a pull up or pull down variation. That's three, and then do an upper back variation. Yeah. But for upper back, you already took care of it with like deadlifts isometrically. So I think a chest supported row at that point is just going to take care of it. That's four exercises. Yeah. And something that you mentioned is like, uh, like I posted a video um, a few days ago of uh, doing a single leg standing leg curl. Um, and, and, I, and I mentioned, yeah, I'm stopping here at a little bit more than 90 degrees of knee flexion. Because if I want to go up and touch my the pad on my on my hamstrings, I can do that, but I would use 30 kilos less than this. Mm. So I'd rather do that on a seated leg curl, which is which is much easier to get into full uh, full contracting uh, full contraction. Uh, but in standing, I can use look, I can use 65 kilos. If I want to do that, I would have to go down to 35. There is a problem there. It can't yeah. like five centimeters of range of motion can't make a 30 kilo difference in loading. There is exactly. an issue there. Yeah. I'd rather use another movement. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's like that's like the Pareto principle. You know, like uh, the 80-20 80, 80, rule. Like, yeah, 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 that 80% of your results are going to come from like 20% yeah. uh, of the work. So I think it's the same there. Like if you were uh, to really, you, you have to put in a disproportionate amount of, of a effort to get that past that last uh, inches and uh, for that i would recommend actually the guys at the triage method uh, gary and yeah. and uh, patty they have a fantastic article about uh, i don't know what it's called but i can send it to you it's about the biomechanical realities of you know basically what you mentioned that you know like people say that for example if you're weaker in the shorter range in a lying leg curl that you just need to train the shorter range more like do you really <laughs> like like you said yourself what is going to be more beneficial really trying to get stronger in a range that you can't really produce much force or trying to use the most weight you can in a range of motion that perhaps is not complete but it will get you 80 percent of the weight there like it seems to me that spending maybe 80% of your time doing ranges of motion, doing the, you know, mostly mid to lengthen range where you're a bit stronger and perhaps allocating 10 to 20% of your time to exercises or to, oh yeah, exercises that load the really contracted range, which can bring some further benefits, but it's probably not going to be I wouldn't spend most of my workout time there, basically. Yeah, I think Joe Bennett is one of those that likes to use like um, the shorter range as a warm up uh, to uh, improve my muscle connection. Like he, I, I remember he does the uh, like he pushes his arm like in shoulder reduction, uh, uh, transverse reduction, internal rotation, and slight uh, and gently pushes the arms to warm up the uh, the pecs. Mm -hmm. I mean but that that makes sense. Yeah. That that makes sense, uh, but then he says spend most of the time in the mid uh, mid length and range, and that's sure. where you will see most result. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the same because you get you get you know you can start really firing up the uh, nervous system. You get a nice uh, my muscle connection. You you get a nice pump, and uh, then you can get into your meat and potatoes, so to speak. You can start getting into some actual work and. Um, Joe Maddus uses the same sequencing as far as I know. Like he, he starts with a pump exercise, then yeah. he does the 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 uh, heavy compound second, and then he finishes with a stretch. And I think yeah. that's a great way to do things. And you know it's funny because I, I, I often think about this. Um, 
if you look at most experienced people who are also like rational, not just the kind of people who just do the same shit over and over again for like decades and, and don't learn anything, but you know, the Jordan Peters of the world, the, the Joes, the Joe Meadows is the, the Brian Cron is another great, great example for coaching. They sort of end up at the same point. Yeah. Or they reach the same conclusions, like uh, anything you can do to remain injury free, anything that allows you to train in a way that's conducive to results, you can progress in, but it's also fun or enjoyable enough that you can actually stick to it and do it for like decades. That's going to be the best way to train. Yeah. Different observation, different population, but similar conclusions that that says a lot about mm -hmm. how one can train with longevity. Um, okay, I think uh, I can think I think we can wrap that up. Um, it was a really interesting conversation. Um, not sure if you I like uh, if you want to mention maybe your coaching services uh, and where people can find you. Uh, your podcast we we mentioned that, but I, I will put everything in the show notes. Yeah, for sure. So thanks for the opportunity. It was really fun. I also uh, enjoyed this. And I, as for you, you can probably tell, I, I like to talk about this. I can talk about this for, yeah. for like for a day and I, I, I just barely get started. So, so yeah, uh, anyone's interested in my stuff, just, you know, check me out on and Instagram is where I spend most of my time. It's Sotek TME. So my name is TME, the master engineer. Um, same on Facebook, uh, you can send me a friend request or that kind of stuff. Check out my podcast, uh, the Master Engineer podcast. I have some very cool interviews there. I think there are hopefully more to come. Um, I try to, I try to publish an episode a week, but it's sort of it tends to, life tends to get in the way and it's usually maybe two to three episodes per month, something like that. But, um, uh, but yeah that's that's what i do most of the time and of course if someone is from 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 romania is listening to this which is not really likely come check out my gym of course marco you if you want to sure. come visit us that would be awesome sure. and if someone wants to you know well, if someone thought that may have perhaps i'm not a complete idiot and they want to reach out uh, and acquire by my coaching services they can do that too Fantastic. I'll put every, every, every link and, and stuff in the show notes after that. Thanks a lot for coming on the podcast. Tada. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye-bye.